Welcome everyone to the computer science seminar series. Today we have two interesting talks. We'll see how interesting they are. But, um, <laughs> in my opinion, they are. Uh, let's see. So first talk will be by Professor uh, Hemant Kumar Singh. So Hemant works in the uh, University of New South Wales, uh, Australia, UNSW. Um, and he did his PhD in UNSW as well. Uh, and uh, undergraduate in uh, in one of the Institute of Technologies in India, which is quite famous uh, institution in India. Um, so Hemant has been working in the engineering department, so he's got a lot of interdisciplinary uh, experience working in the intersection of computer science and uh, engineering, and he works a lot of with engineering problems. Um, and he works as you could see in the multi, well it says as a multidisciplinary design optimization. Um, so I think I'll not take much more of your time. So over to you, Hemant. Thank you, Tinkle, uh, for uh, for the introduction and for for the invitation. Uh, so uh, I'm the opening act for Robin later on. <laughs> in this case. Uh, so, uh, but coming to the uh, the talk itself. So I'll talk about search methods for solving expensive. Uh, optimization problems. Uh, I am uh, currently uh, an associate professor in the uh, University of South Wales, uh, as previously mentioned. So before uh, I move on, I wanted to uh, also just give an idea of who all are the people behind the work I'm going to discuss. <coughs> Sorry, could, could you admit Mohammed? Uh, Sorry, yeah, he's... I, I did already some, some, oh, some yeah. issue here. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. All right, so we have the multidisciplinary design optimization group uh, in, in uh, UNSW in Australia. And we work on diverse areas of computational intelligence with uh, a strong focus on evolutionary computation-based approaches. Um, so also, the nature of problems we are trying to solve, the challenges that we consider, are normally inspired from the engineering design application. So for example, presence of constraints, presence of uh, expensive uh, evaluations, etc. And I'll talk uh, a bit uh, more about that shortly. Uh, the people here in the green box are the current members. Uh, so normally we are a small group, four to six people at a time. Uh, but those, the rest have been, uh, they are graduated, you know, over past, uh, you know, five to ten years or so. And also I'd like to acknowledge the sponsors of the work, which for example, Australian uh, Research Council, which is similar to EPSRC um, here uh, in the UK. And then we had other collaborations from, uh, for example, uh, industry like Honda and also uh, Academy of Science, uh, so other uh, fundamental research-based organizations. So as, as I said, we work in a range of topics. Um, so. Um, I just wanted to give a very high level view of what type of problems we work on. Of course, then we'll um, zone into a couple of uh, them that we're going to today. So um, a large part of our work is dedicated to multi-objective optimization, which is basically searching for optimal solutions when you have more than one conflicting uh, criteria, which happens often uh, in, in real life. So uh, we have worked on, for example, search uh, several search methods uh, for such problems, and also we we'll, we we'll look into how can we uh, benchmark them in a more reliable manner, uh, as well as the decision support. So when you have conflicting objectives, you have more than one optimal solution. So how to decide between them, or to how to how to search uh, specific preferred ones, is uh, is also a interesting sub uh, group of works. Uh, within uh, multi-objective optimization. Um, we deal uh, also with robust optimization where we have um, uncertainties in the decision variables which can propagate to the outcomes. So under such uncertainties, how to find solutions that perform reliably uh, is, is the subject of robust optimization. Then we look at uh, constraint optimization on the top. Uh, so many real world problems might have constraints on safety, uh, manufacturability, cost, etc. Uh, that we need to consider while optimizing. 
So uh, that's another area of work. Then we have multi-fidelity optimization where we have um, evaluations during an optimization can be done at various levels of accuracy at the corresponding levels of cost and you can decide whether you want a, a fast approximation or a, a more uh, uh, accurate uh, high cost evaluation and how to balance between the two. Um, then the last one there is the bi-level optimization where you have hierarchical decision making. So for example there could be a, a governmental policies on one level with their own objectives and then there could be a, a company working uh, at a lower level who has to not only comply but has to also try to optimize their own objectives um, based on the regulations. So it forms so-called hierarchical optimization and we have proposed some uh, uh, algorithms for that type of problems as well. Um, so everything in green is just abbreviations of the algorithm, some of the algorithms we have developed. Uh, more on that can be found in the papers. Uh, and uh, also there can be always combinations of these problems. So bi-level problems can also have multiple objectives. Uh, constrained optimization could also involve uncertainty, etc. Okay. So there can always be uh, multiple combinations. Um, okay, now another thing that you might notice is some of them, some of these topics I have put as star, uh, a star there. So all these uh, works actually um, deal with so-called expensive optimization, which uh, is primary focus of the two works I discuss, I'll discuss today. Okay, so what are expensive optimization problems? Um, normally, uh, when you run any optimization algorithm, you would evaluate several candidate solutions to improve the objective value until you reach the best one or the optimal one. <coughs> Now, imagine that if each of those candidate design evaluation took a lot of cost in terms of time or in terms of money. So, for example, if you're running, if you're optimizing an aerofoil a design, and every evaluation, for every design evaluation, you need to run a long simulation like a CFD, or you want to, or you need to put it in a wind tunnel to test its performance as a physical experiment then it's an expensive evaluation. Okay? So you have to think very carefully about which designs to evaluate so that with minimum number of evaluations you can get to, uh, to the best solution or the optimal solution. So the general assumption there is that the algorithmic operator, so within what you do within the algorithm in terms of deciding which solution to evaluate has relatively low cost compared to the evaluation itself. So everything boils down to can you reduce the evaluation? Okay, internally you can do other operations. Their time complexity, etc., are not that heavy uh, compared to the evaluation. So, for example, um, you could take a minute to decide which design to evaluate, but the design itself may take five hours. Right, so that's the scale. So to reduce the evaluations, uh, so we are talking about maybe a few hundred evaluations, we need to get to the optimum. So the use of surrogate models is very common, uh, which basically means that once you have evaluated a few designs at the beginning, you can fit some sort of a regression or a classification model on it to get some idea of what the function looks like. And based on that, you can do some sort of internal search on that surrogate model to then uh, identify which are the regions that are most, most promising and then sample the true evaluation there. So there are various ways in which surrogate models can be used. Um, and there are various works dis discussing how to manage the data, how to manage uh, the models themselves, uh, which surrogate model to use, etc. Okay, and these are some practical examples that, for example, uh, that, that we, uh, have dealt with in our group, uh, uh, so like spacecraft design, uh, underwater vehicle optimization, ship hull optimization, uh, wind farm design. So they're all engineering focused examples, but the techniques are not limited to engineering design itself. Okay, so uh, I'll come to the first topic that I want to discuss in more detail today, which is the partial evaluations for uh, expensive constraint uh, optimization. So constraint problems look uh, a bit like this. So you have on the top a few objectives, uh, these functions f, 
and they are subject to some constraints, uh, g less than equal to zero. You might also see them formulated as maximization problem, and you might also see them g is greater than zero, etc. They can all be easily interchangeable, uh, easily converted to each other. So, so this is a generalized form uh, in any case. Now, uh, so objectives, what we are trying to optimize, so many maximize or minimize, for example. So we're trying to maximize fuel efficiency, minimize weight uh, of a design, etc. And then constraints are the criteria which we must not violate uh, while searching for those design, such as structural integrity, safety, uh, manufacturability, cost, etc. So these functions that I mentioned here, they can be highly nonlinear. They can be block, black box, so they could be hidden entirely. So as a uh, user, you may only be able to see the input and output and not what happens uh, in between. Okay, so when, um, so how to deal with constraints within uh, the evolutionary algorithm or any algorithm is actually a well-researched topic. So there are multiple even surveys covering different uh, timelines, etc. And almost all of them would at least calculate these quantities. Uh, so constraint violation, which is basically if, if a constraint is not satisfied, then by how much it is violated. So that's constraint violation. And then if you have multiple constraints, then those violations can be combined to give uh, some value. So sum of CVs or uh, max value, CV max. And these values are basically then, they can be used in deciding uh, which solution is better than the other. Um, so for example, the most popular algorithm in SGA2, it, uh, in, in the domain of evolutionary computation, uh, is uh, what it would do is to compare between solutions. It would take feasible solutions. Uh, they go on the top. That's the blue one there. They get sorted on their objective value. Infeasible solutions go below, the, the, so the white <coughs> region there. And uh, they are ranked based on their constraint violation value. So either CV sum or CV max. Uh, and then the top half is kept for the next generation. <coughs> the remainder are discarded. Okay, so that's how the then evolutionary algorithm then further progresses. OK, so what we are trying to address in this particular work is that most of the existing approaches are so-called uh, full evaluation based, which means for any candidate design that is identified for evaluation, all objectives and constraints are evaluated by default. And actually, the operators here uh, assume this knowledge. You can see this is summation of all the constraint violations, and this is max over all constraint violations. Okay, So implicitly, this assumption of full evaluation uh, is, is used in most of the works that exist. Uh, and it may be because most algorithms are developed using benchmarks, and there it's easy to do such a thing. But many real-world problems involve independently evaluable constraints, <coughs> where you have multiple expensive constraints, and you can evaluate them independently. So then it makes sense to consider whether you can only evaluate some of the constraint in order to save the cost involved in the others. Okay. So that's what uh, this uh, work uh, proposes. Okay, so this is the main idea. So can we selectively evaluate a reduced set of constraints uh, to extract necessary information for, uh, for the algorithm to progress? OK, so I will not go into too much detail given the uh, time, but the main idea is this. So if you have, let's say, this is your um, this is your fun this is how your function looks like, and uh, you have this objective function fx, the green curve here, and you have the four constraint functions which are feasible when they are lower than uh, zero. Okay, so this gray region is where all constraints are satisfied, so that's a feasible region, and everywhere else it's infeasible region. Okay, now we want to find out what the constraint violation is for the ranking, right? So. In the left-hand side, if you see, uh, there's only this blue constraint that goes above this dotted line. Okay, So that's the only one that's infeasible. The other three constraints are actually satisfying the constraint. They are below the zero line. So if through some magic ball I could find or I could determine that uh, I need to evaluate only G1, 
this blue constraint in order to compute my constraint violation, then I can forego the other constraints uh, and save, in this case, three units of cost. And also I can forego evaluation of the objectives, in which case I save four units of cost. The reason I can forego them is because to rank the infeasible solution, I only needed the CV uh, as per the previous slide. Right? So, uh, so if I use that concept then, then I can uh, do this. But I don't know how uh, or which constraints is actually violated. So that's where the surrogate modeling uh, comes in. And there can be other ways to do what we have done. But general idea is that we build the surrogate models for each of the constraints. And for every constraint, we will try to predict what the value of that constraint will be at any given design. Um, and we start with the one that is most likely to be violated. Okay, so based on the prediction, we can tell, based on the approximate model, we can tell which of the constraints are likely to be violated. We evaluate that first. If it turns out that it, it is uh, not violated, it's actually satisfying the constraint, then we go to the next one. So we have used one unit of evaluation, but we have learned that our model was not so accurate there. And this new evaluation will help us in building a better model in the future. But essentially, that's the core of the, of the method. And uh, rest is the detail. I'll probably, uh, uh, yeah, I'll just show you the, the proof of concept here. So there are six solutions. and. If we rank them based on the true values, so all constraints evaluated versus only a few evaluated. So this is these are the constraints evaluated through our approach. Uh, they basically uh, give you almost the same ranking at 50% of the cost. So, so you save a lot of cost by doing this while having minimal impact on the algorithm itself. And uh, so to... Um, so this was benchmarked against uh, the other constraint optimization algorithm <coughs> there. And we could, in some cases, uh, we were able to save up to 99% of the cost, which is very high at savings. But of course, it's problem dependent. Sometimes the saving could be none as well. Like in this case, there was almost no saving. But uh, in most cases, we have you know a, a substantial amount. So it could be 40%, 50%. So. Uh, so varies by the problem, but on an average, uh, better. Okay, so that's that was the constraint one. Then the next one that I wanted to uh, discuss today is uh, called a steady state approach for multi-objective expensive optimization. So in this case, we are not talking about constraints, but instead we are talking about uh, multiple objectives. Okay, so. Um, the solution of a multi-objective problem, where you have more than one conflicting objectives, is a Pareto front like this. So here, for example, if you're doing a structural design, you want to minimize stresses and the mass of, of a cross-section of a beam, then you would have at one end a solution that has very low stresses but high mass. And on the other end, you will have something that has a very uh, relatively high stress, but um, uh, much lower mass. Okay, so there's a trade-off between these two objectives. So what we are seeking in this case is uh, a so-called Pareto front of solutions, which means among all possible solutions, these these trade-off solutions, these are the Pareto front, they do not get dominated by any other solution in the objective space. Which means there exists no other solution which can beat these ones in both the objectives. So the uh, target is to approximate this uh, Pareto front through a finite number of solutions that are uniformly covering that Pareto front. Okay, so this is again quite an actively researched field. Several algorithms uh, are published in this area. Uh, I have listed some of them here, and also we have published a couple of them in, in our previous work. Uh, but there are many further challenges. So. The one that we look look at in in here is the case where the evaluations are not parallelizable. So uh, you might have a simulation software for which you have only one, one license, for example, or you might have only a single experimental setup. So every time you decide to evaluate a design, you can do only one design, okay? so not multiple. Um, so we need to 
find a, an algorithm that can select that in the best possible way um, so that it can then uh, be able to approximate the parent of fronts of different types of shape uh, uniformly. <coughs> now, the limitation currently is that most of the state-of-the-art methods, so these are published all within last two, three, maybe maximum five years, they all follow so-called generational model, which means uh, in every generation you evaluate more than one solution. Uh, five is a commonly used number. Uh, so, and what we find out is if we set this parameter to just one, to evaluate one at a time, their performance actually goes down, which is a bit counterintuitive because your model is being updated more frequently, but the performance is, is not improving. And the reason for that we figure is that this evolution of, uh, sorry, evaluation of multiple designs is almost a diversity preserving criteria in many of these algorithms. So um, that's why they do not do so well with steady state. Uh, okay. Uh, now, there also exist many steady state approaches which do evaluate one solution at a time or provide mechanisms to do so. Um, and what we found with those is that their performance tends to degrade when your Pareto fronts have some irregular shapes. So for example here, the, sh the front has these steep uh, regions uh, which are not well approximated by these algorithms because they use uh, something called acquisition functions in the background and often they tend to be, uh, at least in our study, their selection pressure tends to be biased towards certain regions. So uh, in this case, even though many solutions have been sampled, including some in this region, there is, there is no pressure to sample some solutions in this empty uh, region of the, where the Pareto front doesn't have any solutions. So what we are aiming for is something like this. Uh, so this is the kind of results which would come out of our algorithm where you have for this type of front or many other types of irregular fronts, you would sample somewhere where um, actually you do not have representatives. Uh, this is easy to do in regular fronts, so linear or close to quadratic fronts, but not so easy in other type of irregular fronts. And this is uh, just to show that both steady state and generational algorithms struggle with uh, such problems. Uh, so we have created these different uh, highly convex uh, and concave problems, and we can see that distribution is uh, not so good for, for most of the algorithms. So this is the general framework of the, of the proposed algorithm. And uh, I've just highlighted here what the key features are. So mainly, we start off with uh, generating and evaluating some initial solutions. Based on that, we construct a, a model, surrogate model. We run an internal EA on the surrogate model to find so-called candidate solutions. So these are not fully evaluated, obviously. These are candidates for evaluation. And then we apply uh, a two-stage selection on that candidate set. Uh, to identify then one uh, that is going to be evaluated. So basically, uh, the key features of this algorithm, we, when we are building the models, we are trying to utilize effectively the uncertainty in the information, including, uh, so we use things like probabilistic dominance and um, holonomous distance. They both consider uncertainties in the predictions uh, to improve our selection mechanism. And then we have, uh, selection criterion which uh, takes into account distances between solutions to sample the correct ones. Uh, and then we have some fail-safe mechanisms like, in this case, so-called shadow ND solutions, where if our selected solution ends up being dominated or close, very close to a dominant solution, then we tag it in a way that it's not selected again in the uh, near future. Okay, so I have more details of this, but probably just given the time I probably will skip that part. Uh, just, uh, just to round this up, I'll say that results uh, are, are uh, quite good, especially for the irregular shape problem. So this one, for example, TR1 to TR3, that uh, I had shown some results of previous algorithms before. Uh, here, in this graph, you can see it compared to many algorithms. And 
the area under the curve in this case shows a better algorithm. So, so the one proposed is actually just a straight line up here, which essentially its translation is that it was the best in those problems compared to the other algorithms. For other problems, a bit more regular type of problems or mixed type of problems, the, the performance is either competitive or a little better. Okay, so, so it wouldn't give you benefit in all cases, as, as is, happens with most algorithms. Uh, but especially for irregular problems, it shows the benefit uh, very well. And these are the approximations you get out of the algorithm. So again, if we go back to these problems, which had very highly concave and convex uh, uh, parameter fronts, it's able to cover those much more regularly uh, than the other algorithms. OK, so I went through these very quickly, but I hope we'll have more time to discuss them in these two conferences, CEC uh, in Yokohama next year and Gecko in Melbourne next year. Uh, so I am publicity chair for that one and competition chair for this one. <laughs> but this is the one I am most excited about. So we have Evolutionary Multi-Criterion and Optimization Conference in 2025 in Canberra where I live and work. Uh, so I am general chair along with Professor Ray and also Professor Joshua knows. Uh, apologies for missing him in the slide. But uh, but yeah, uh, so, that, so the, it's a single track conference focus on all aspects of multi-objective optimization. And uh, we hope that those of you who work in it would consider uh, traveling to Canberra and attending the conference with us. Thank you. Thanks, Simon. We've got time for a couple of questions. <clears throat> I have one that's possibly naive. Um, Given you're looking at ways to reduce the number of constraints that you possibly evaluate, yeah. <clears throat> would you ever in practice find that you've given a constraint that's actually useless? You always exclude it when you're looking for ones to not evaluate. Uh, it's possible. If So normally, optimum solutions lie on the constraint <coughs> boundaries. So if there's a constraint which is uh, left redundant by other constraints. So if it's feasible area uh, is, uh, well, okay, let me try another one. So if the optimum solution does not lie on that constraint, and uh, it is, it has such a, the constraint is so easy to satisfy that all the optimal uh, region or close to it is defined by the rest of the constraints, then it's likely that it may not get evaluated because its probability of violation may always remain very low. And when we go in the sequence from high to low, we may never reach <laughs> the, the last one. Yeah. People actually propose those as constraints if they're that easy to satisfy? Actually, that's a, uh, that's a formulation issue. So it's not an algorithmic issue. So while formulating the problem, it probably doesn't make sense to put in a constraint that's <coughs> always going to be satisfied. Yeah. Any more, more questions to humans? Uh, you mentioned all, all, all the constraints you talked about are have like very linearly or you know some numerically, whereas lots of constraints that I end up dealing with are binary. So you know it either runs or it doesn't. For example, you can even get a function value where you can't. Right. So that's sort of a, a pseudo constraint. So how would that fit into these these kinds of frameworks? Right. So in that case, the Modeling has to the surrogate modeling has to be able to. Uh, that's a hard constraint, isn't it? Just yes and no. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so whenever we predict a value for a constraint, right? It so in this case it's a real value, um, and it's uh, yeah. So if it's a zero one type of constraint, it might either be approximated, it's possible to approximate using classifier, for example. So the surrogate model we use for that constraint may not be a Gaussian process. Uh, it may be a different type of surrogate model. Uh, and then we could predict whether it's uh, 0 or 1. And then uh, we can apply either the same principle where you go in the sequence of you know high violation to low violation, uh, in which case, so here the highest violation would just be 1. Uh, but possibly it could also be uh, done based on 
uh, something like probability of feasibility. So in GPs, you have you can predict the probability rather than trying to measure directly the CV. Uh, that that should <coughs> possibly address uh, such cases. But in this case, we have considered continuous variables. Yeah. Uh, yeah, like sure. <laughs> so when when you uh, select which constraint to ignore, so that's kind of you have to know a priori somehow. Did you make any tests to say the impact if you choose the wrong one? Like if you choose something that should be evaluated, do you have any enough how that would affect the results? Yes. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I didn't have time for uh, to discuss this graph. So basically, this graph is essentially describing uh, that. So um, in the beginning, when we have only a few data points, we have kind of poor models for almost all constraints. So when we build a sequence, if we compare it to a sequence that is based on true evaluation of all objectives, that correlation is being shown uh, on this graph. So this blue curve, it starts off with a, with a very poor rank correlation. Uh, but approximately 20 odd generations in, it you know, models become reliable enough that uh, that the correlation goes very high. So it means then our ranking is you know roughly based on the predictions is 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 the same as what uh, it would be based on fully valid. It's not the same, but it's close. And but at the same time, we are saving a lot of evaluations, so we have a longer runtime for the same number of evaluations, right? So if we're doing full evaluations, we are limited. Uh, but if we have similar or sim uh, similarly effective ranking, but we have much longer number of generations for the same cost, then we are we will end up in a better uh, position. For comparison, the red one is just a random sequence. So if I had just chosen a random sequence to do the constraint evaluation, then <coughs> its correlation does not improve uh, with time. Okay. Thank you. I think we've got to move on now. But let's leave the rest of the question at the end of the second talk. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.